Marxism is a continuation of a long-standing trend in human history, right? You can go back to Julius Caesar, who fought for the rights of the proletarians in ancient Rome. Uh, you can talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh and how uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, they believed in this, this myth of this, this character called Gilgamesh, who was a human being who killed a, a mighty bull, a bull that was huge, but it was because he was a human being, he had possessed intelligence, that he was able to slay this mighty creature, this bull of heaven, and that being that because human beings are, are better than animals, and actually the tradition of bullfighting in, in Latin America and in Spain is actually rooted in the Epic of Gilgamesh, particularly interestingly, and that, that if you look through all human history, there's always been what you could call the city builders, and those who seek to advance human progress, build a better life, advance science, advance art, advance creativity, and, and get beyond the hardships and horrors of the world and get to a, a more humane society where people are taken care of and where there's a higher level of solidarity among the people. Um, and that Marxism is simply the, the current incarnation of that trend in human history, right? It's people coming out of the French Revolution, coming out of the English Revolution, and, the, and really the, the German Revolution of 1848, which Marx participated in, seeing that capitalism had not created a, a new order of freedom and justice, that there was still a problem, that, 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 that all of the, uh, the kings and queens and nobles of old Europe had been replaced with the factory owners and the bankers, and that, that, uh, that, that, that human serfdom and slavery had been replaced with wage slavery, and that ultimately the only way this could be res resolved and the only way human progress could continue to advance is if the major centers of economic power, the factories, the banks, were under public control and operated rationally so that we as a species could continue marching toward better things and, and ultimately toward the vision of a world that was so comfortable we don't even need a government. That's the vision of Marxism. But unfortunately, when you go to the university and you learn Marxism, you learn something completely different, right? I mean, I, I've had people often, the, the, the great cliche is people say, how do you wear those really nice shoes and be a Marxist, right? <laughs> Right. Or, 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 or people say, well, China can't be a socialist country because there's billionaires there. Right. Well, I, the vision of Marxism is that everyone should be able to live the life of a billionaire. Right. Mm -hmm. We're all billionaires compared to people who lived 200 years ago. Right. You know, the, the idea that, that, that Marxism is about wanting people to have less, wanting people to be poorer, wanting people to be less prosperous. That's 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 a distortion. Marxism is about raising the standard of living. But it points out that the way that those who get wealthy under capitalism get wealthy is largely by making other people poor, right? Mm -hmm. That's how the capitalists acquire their wealth is by keeping people poor, driving countries around the world into poverty, you know, lowering the wages of the working class, you know, hooking people on opioids, locking people in a prison industrial complex, destroying countries with a military industrial complex, that the capitalists, their wealth comes from impoverishing others. And we want to create a society where wealth Wealth leads to more other people becoming wealthy, where, you know, as they say, that a, that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? That, that, that socialism is about, you know, just increasing living standards by having rational human reason control the economy, not the anarchy of production or the chaos of the market. The capitalist only does it if he can make a profit off of it. He doesn't care about the results. And, and as a result, we have a society that's completely crazy and distorted. In times past, people were hungry because there wasn't enough food. Now, under capitalism, people go hungry because there's too much food, right? In times past, people you know, were homeless because there was a shortage of housing. Well, now, under capitalism, people are homeless because there is too much housing. This is an irrational system, and it requires you know, the, the means of production, the centers of economic power to be controlled by society and rationally operated and a line of march. Uh, that's what Marx talks about, a line of march to be laid out to, to raise living standards and have the economy be planned. Um, and, and China is a success story. China used to be one of the poorest countries in the world. Now it's the second largest economy in the world. Russia, with socialism, became the first country in outer space. You know, Socialism is, is all about taking responsibility and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but doing it in a way that doesn't come at the expense of anyone else. Right. Oh yeah, definitely, and and I think uh, you hit a central point is that socialists in the 21st century have to frame their argument in the sense of construction. Socialism is about building and constructing, not just tearing down what exists. And I had this issue uh, myself. I, I've evolved throughout the years. Like I, you know, when I was around 14, 15, I became interested in atheism, and then eventually communism. And I would, you know, speak uh, very negatively or 
um, patronizing toward people who were religious and and in a way that was like not constructive. You know what I mean? We, even though we, we shared the same social values of eliminating hunger, poverty, I, w- I would, you know, like we would hit a wall when it came to religion. And so for me now, like that doesn't matter. I think what, if people want to have uh, follow a religion, that's totally up to them in their personal life. Um, and I think that we have to keep this moving forward with building and constructing. And I like the fact that in Iran, for example, uh, Ahmadinejad's party is called the Alliance of Builders. Of, con- of construction, I think I forget the exact translation, but it's like something like the Alliance of Builders. And uh, I remember a few years back when he was speaking at Columbia University, I was reading uh, some of the articles about him from the Iranian press, and it talked about that same point, right? That we want a model of construction and development that isn't based on uh, usury or exploitation, like it is, for example, in Israel, where and he and there is a comparison, right? Because like Iran. Is, is a very stable and prosperous country in the Middle East uh, because uh, its economic model of development is build on, built on self-development and construction and not exploitation of other people uh, like it is with Israel. And that's the kind of stuff that in the 21st century we have to keep in mind is like, uh, we wanna inspire people to build and create because it can take 10 years to build something. Uh, in Ecuador, for example, you know, I, I was living there uh, just like a year and a half ago, and the people love Rafael Correa. Everyone loves Rafael Correa because they can see the tangible stuff that they built. It only took a few months for some of that stuff to be deconstructed. And right now, Ecuador is unfortunately spiraling down into right. a neoliberal mess. Uh, and it's so easy to tear down, uh, but it's uh, 10 times harder to build up. And that being said, I wanted to ask you to kind of like wrap up. Um, what would you say, what advice would you have for young, uh, young people, especially young men who are like 18, 19, uh, who are, who have heard about people like Jordan Peterson or Stefan Molyneux, um, and they want to improve themselves, but they want to, uh, transition over to more, uh, Marxist or socialist, uh, figures who are pro, uh, development and pro self-improvement, uh, what kind of material would you suggest for them to make that leap? One of the best books I ever read was called The Stalin Era by Anna mm-hmm. Louise Strong. And this is an American journalist from Seattle who was living in the Soviet Union during the 1930s. And she describes what she witnessed, which was a whole country pulling itself up by its bootstraps, industrializing, building itself up. And, and becoming a, a global superpower. And, and if you want to talk about grit and struggle and working hard and all of that, she, she describes it. And she describes the conversation she had with people all over the country. And there's a reason that today Stalin is wildly popular in, in Russia, right? If you go to Russia, you know, at least half the people say that Stalin was mostly good. You know, people will say that Stalin was like Hitler. But if you go to Germany, nobody likes Hitler. Right. Even the far right wing people say that they hate Hitler. Nobody likes Hitler. But you go to Russia. Stalin is like the man. Right. And you ask them why they'll say Stalin built up our country. You know, we were just a poor agrarian country. And then Stalin came here and he organized us. And Stalin isn't even Russian. He was Georgian. He's from Georgia. But he's one of the most popular people in all of Russia because of his ability to bring a country together, bring people of different nationalities together organize them to build up the country and then to defeat the Nazi invaders. And then eventually, right, you know, right after Stalin died, they became the first country in outer space. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would encourage people to read, you know, Anna Louise Strong's book, uh, you know, you know, the Stalin era um, or, or you read some of what President Xi Jinping is putting out, where he talks about socialism with Chinese characteristics and how socialism is a big aspect of what has made China, which is a 5000 year old civilization what has made them really rise up. You know, he talks about the Chinese dream of a country that was impoverished, restoring its place in, in world civilization. You know, there are a lot of things that, that I, I think that, that people that are in that situation, that, that are young, that are frustrated with the economy, that want to do better in the world, can identify with in socialist literature. And that I think that unfortunately, that for many, many young people, uh, for many of the people in the Bernie movement, socialism in a lot of ways articulates kind of a, a resentment. 
You yeah. know, I know I, I, I like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in a lot of ways. I met her. She's a nice woman. You know, she has very good intentions. But when she says she wants to abolish billionaires, right, what she's really playing at is a resentment. People are like, hey, I want to have a billion dollars. Somebody else has it. That's not fair. But you can't, you know, you can't build a movement on the basis of resentment. You know what I'm saying? And then a lot of a lot of what left wing circles do is they just kind of stoke resentment. This person has had a bit better chance in life than I've had. This person has some kind of privilege that I don't have. And they kind of get people to resent each other. And it's not, you know, the, the broad masses of society resenting the fact that capitalism is keeping the society poor, but rather it's people in the working class resenting each other. Well, you've got male privilege. Yeah. Well, you've got white privilege. Yeah. Well, you've got cis privilege. You're not transgender. Yeah. Well, you've got straight privilege. You know, and, and, and everyone just kind of this circle of people resenting each other, boiling resentment, pointing fingers at each other. You've got it too good. No, you've got it too good. You should be worse <laughs> off. You should be worse off. And that that creates this negative energy that ultimately is nothing but destructive. And that I think that these young men, uh, they, they, they probably hear that and they think, well, I want to advance in the world. I don't think I have it too good. I want to advance. And so they, they turn away from socialism. But I think what they're looking for, they can find in a lot of different socialist literature and a lot of the socialism that has gone on in the 20th century and even in the Bolivarian countries of the 21st century, um, if they can look beyond the, the Western postmodernist uh, left and into the actual constructive socialist left, I think they can find what they're looking for.